Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and this is part two of uh, utilizing the Montrose model to illustrate the creation and in, uh, elimination of an inflationary gap. In this video, we're going to look at the creation and elimination of a recessionary gap. In that previous video, and there'll be a link probably in the top right corner here to that video, uh, we used the Montrose model side, next to the business cycle just to illustrate the connection between the two. In the business cycle, we're measuring time on the x-axis, real GDP on the y-axis. We know that uh, economies cycle upwards into inflationary gaps and downwards into recessionary gaps. And we, collect, and we can collect all of the unemployment and inflation data and real GDP data and build a trend line, which we see here, the long-term growth trend which is illustrating the potential amount of output an economy produces when it's at what we call full employment. That long-term growth trend in the Montrose model is the long-run aggregate supply curve, thus Y potential, real GDP at potential GDP. In that video, we saw how increased aggregate demand due in part in the United States from the CARES Act and the stimulus checks that were provided to uh, US citizens and residents uh, during the COVID period where middle-class uh, households were saving that and then spending it as we exited the pandemic led to what we call demand pull inflation, thus potentially price level rising from PL1 to PL2 or inflation rising from two to 4% approximately. Uh, again, uh, that was part of this CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act here we had economic stimulus, perhaps expansionary fiscal policy, about $2.2 trillion being spent into the economy, which included transfer payments to households of amounts ranging from $1,200 plus uh, to get through the hardships of the pandemic. So in that video, demand pull, 81 to 82, we get demand pull inflation. But then we also have, in part due to the uh, supply chain shocks from the pandemic and also the Russian Ukrainian war, rising costs of production, which is what we call cost push inflation. We highlighted how the Russian Ukraine war has led to rising food prices. Here we see rising wheat prices uh, during the Russian Ukrainian war. That will contribute to cost push inflation. Rising crude oil prices. Here we see. Um, this increase up here during the Russian Ukrainian war, raising petroleum prices, also natural grass prices, we can see spiking here. So all of that energy and rising food prices, along with bottlenecks, uh, inability of firms to quickly ramp up production as we exit the pandemic, and also this zero COVID policies, which restricts labor, let's say in China, from being able to go out and work and manufacture inputs and outputs, all of that is leading to cost push inflation. Thus, SRS1 to SRS2, more inflation, 4 to 8% in the United States. In my lifetime, I've never seen 8% inflation in the US. Now we're seeing it. Thus, we're at point C. So the goal of this video is to illustrate what's to come, what will happen in the future. And uh, we're already seeing, for example, the United States Federal Reserve, the U.S. Uh, Central Bank, raising interest rates. We're exiting the pandemic, and here we can see this dramatic increase in interest rates from, uh, let's say, 0.25%, uh, percent, going up to 2.5%, and potentially it can go higher. The Federal Reserve is trying to reduce demand pull inflation, making it difficult for households and firms to borrow and spend into the economy. And this is not only happening in the United States, we see uh, many developed nations, central banks raising interest rates at the same time. So in this report from the World Bank, there is the likelihood, the strong likelihood of a global recession in 2023 as a result of central banks worldwide raising interest rates to curb inflation. Uh, I will have a link to this article in the notes of this video below. And it's highlighting the potential risks of these central banks independent of each other, raising interest rates as opposed to coordinating with each other.
The goal of these interest rate hikes is to reduce demand pull inflation. And at the bottom of that article, it highlights some potential solutions that we could evaluate. But here they're asking for easing labor market constraints where uh, governments can work towards um, increasing labor force participation and reallocating labor uh, so that we can get an increase in aggregate supply. Uh, also working with other nations to increase global supply of needed inputs or commodities that would cause SRS to increase and reduce cost push inflation. And also coordination between nations to uh, address global su supply bottlenecks, uh, trying to encourage and incentivize manufacturers worldwide and uh, transportation, cargo ships to uh, get inputs and outputs to port um, and nations working towards offloading cargo and getting it into their economy uh, to reduce shortages. So basically these solutions right here are focused on getting the SRES curve to shift out. So that's what we're going to use. We're going to talk about the central banks raising interest rates and the impact on aggregate demand and if nations could coordinate how they can increase the aggregate supply. All right, so let's get to it. So here we are. And uh, I'm going to erase a few things so that we can use it for our deflationary model. So this will be the mattress model. And here we're going to be illustrating a deflationary gap. The creation and elimination of a deflationary gap. And that's going to illustrate us going from point C here to point D, going into the predicted global recession in 2023 and hopefully recovering at point E. So C, D, E will be the focus of uh, this video. So let's get rid of what we don't need. We're not going to be addressing the inflationary gap being created. So I'm going to erase that from the previous video. We're not entering an inflationary gap in this video, so that is gone. That's the unemployment rate that we use, 3.9% for the US. Uh, we're gonna get rid of this, and also the labeling. Here, 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 and also here, here, and here. So now we're ready to start. So. Here, we're going to start at point C, point C here. Uh, we still have about 8% inflation in the economy, where SRS 1 and 81 intersect. It starts off our price level at PL1 with that high inflation rate. So we're at SRS 1, which will eventually go to SRS 2. And we're starting at 81. And that's going to go down to 82. Okay, so here we go. So here we are at point C, and we're facing, let's look at the United States, 8% uh, inflation. So the Federal Reserve has a 2% target rate. They want to get inflation down to 2%. That is their mandate. How will they do that? Well, the central bank really can only influence aggregate demand. They cannot really influence aggregate supply. And we know that aggregate demand is equal to, let me make a little bit more space here. Aggregate demand, 81, is equal to GDP, C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Consumption spending, investment spending, government spending, and exports minus imports. So the Federal Reserve is going to begin to raise interest rates, which is going to make it difficult for households and firms to borrow and spend into the economy. Thus, consumption spending will fall and investment spending will fall. Again, all right, the central bank, the United States, is increasing interest rates. They're using contractionary monetary policy. So it's going to make it difficult for households and firms to borrow. So consumption investment spending falls. That's going to cause aggregate demand to shift in from 81 to 82. That's going to take us to point C, um, sorry, point D here. Now we're entering a recessionary gap. We're going from C to D. We are entering that recessionary gap. 
as a result of the central bank contracting the supply of money. That will take us to a new price level where 82 equals SRS1 at point D with price level falling to uh, PL2. And that hopefully will reduce some of that demand pull inflation, bringing inflation down, let's say hypothetically to 4%, but it comes at the cost of taking the economy into a recessionary gap. So we're going from YP to Y recession and unemployment will then increase potentially. Here we have some unemployment data in the United States. Uh, since the 2008 economic crisis, it had been at about 10%, then it fell. With COVID, it went up to beyond 14% and then it rapidly fell, but it could potentially rise maybe between eight to 10%. So let's say that it rises from 5% to, if we're lucky, 8% unemployment, a signal that we are in a recessionary gap. Um, as aggregate demand is pulled back and there's less aggregate demand, firms will reduce the quantity of their aggregate supply and they will begin to fire resources, which explains the rising unemployment. Now what? What's going to happen? A uh, neoclassical monetarist uh, economist would say the government should do nothing, that unemployed resources would cause their values to fall, wages, rent, interest, and profit to fall. But in the 20th and 21st century, we have certain price floors, minimum wage, labor contracts, labor unions that prevents that from happening. But as noted in this report from the World Bank, if we can get these types of solutions moving where we can employ labor potentially at hopefully not lower wages, but more workers working. If we can boost global supply of commodities, so input prices fall for food and energy. And if we can uh, reduce the number of bottlenecks caused as a result of the COVID disruptions in supply, that can push short run aggregate supply outward. So if that's achieved, then the short run aggregate supply should begin to fall. Costs of production falling. Uh, commodity prices, wheat prices, other cereal grain prices, petroleum prices, natural gas prices, if those things can fall with potentially even wages, um, then the cost of production falls with it and SRS begins to shift downward. We can also say it's shifting outward. That takes us to point E. Here we are, point E. So we're coming out of the recession over time, and the economy is beginning to recover, and we're going back to full potential. A lower price level due to lower prices for outputs as a result of lower price inputs, those commodity prices coming down, would enable firms to lower their prices, and they would be motivated to do so because in microeconomics, according to the law of demand, if prices falls, the quantity of demand falls. So hopefully in the aggregate, the quantity of aggregate demand begins to increase as households take advantage of these lower prices. And as the quantity of aggregate demand decreases, firms are more likely to employ resources, thus unemployment begins to fall uh, back to 5%. And we're at point E, we're at full potential. And we have met that objective of bringing inflation down to 2% through a combination of contractionary monetary policy and also coordination between nations to increase the global supply of needed inputs to reduce costs of production. So I will then analyze this as we would for a paper exam. As can be seen in graph A, we're using the monetarist model to illustrate a deflationary gap being created. Graph B is the US business cycle in this example to illustrate the connection between the business cycle and the monetarist model. In uh, graph B, we're measuring time on the x-axis and real GDP on the y-axis. The monetarist model, we're measuring price level on the y-axis and real GDP on the x-axis. The business cycle has a long-term growth trend that illustrates the potential GDP, which is represented in the monetarist model through the long-run aggregate supply curve that is perfectly inelastic. In this model, we have two downward sloping aggregate demand curves, 81 and 82, downward sloping according to the wealth effect, the interest rate effect, and the um, 
uh, international trade effect. We have two upward sloping short run aggregate supply curves. They're upward sloping because firms in the aggregate are motivated to increase their quantity of aggregate supply as the price level rises if resource prices are held constant because their profits would thus increase. Where, let's say, AD1 equals short run aggregate supply one, which is equal to the long run aggregate supply, that establishes an equilibrium price level at PL1 and real GDP at YP. We're at full employment. We can assume that 5% of the labor force is employed. Um, and PL1, because of the uh, high inflation that was discussed in the first video, we're at 8% inflation. Fine. So we're at point C. Then the central bank of the United States, the central bank of the U.S., seeking to achieve their 2% mandate of inflation, engages in what we call contractionary monetary policy. Contractionary monetary policy. They're reducing the supply of money, thus interest rates begin to rise. Interest rates are a reflection of the value of money and its scarcity. Interest rates begin to rise. What happens? That will cause households and firms to borrow less and spend less. Thus, consumption spending falls, investment spending falls. Thus, AD shifts in from 81 to 82. Now we see where 82 equals short run aggregate supply 1 it is collectively less than the LRAS, so we have entered a recessionary or deflationary gap. Here, real GDP has fallen to Y recession, and uh, the price level has fallen to PL2. This contractionary monetary policy is potentially successful in reducing, reducing demand pull inflation and bringing inflation down from PL1 to PL2, potentially bringing it down from 8% to 4%. But that comes at the cost of rising unemployment. As uh, aggregate demand falls, firms begin to reduce the quantity of the aggregate supply from point C to D or from YP to Y recession, meaning that they will begin to fire X uh, resources like land, labor, and capital, thus explaining the higher unemployment. Um, if nations follow the recommendations of the World Bank in which they ease labor market constraints so that firms can easily employ labor to produce more outputs. If nations work together in coordinating their efforts to increase the supply of food and energy to reduce the value and price of these needed inputs, and if uh, nations can work together in uh, allocating resources to increase the global supply and get um, cargo off cargo ships at port and into the economy, et cetera, that would all have the effect of reducing the costs of production. And thus SRS would shift downward or outward from SRS1 to SRS2. That will take us to where SRS2 equals 82, which is equal to LRAS. That will provide us with a price level of PL3 and real GDP back at YP. If firms are able to reduce their costs of production and gain access to needed inputs in the global economy, then SRS shifts outward, and thus they can price lower. If input prices falls, output prices will fall, and the lower price level will enable households to increase the quantity of their aggregate demand from point D to E, or from Y recession to YP, allowing firms to employ more resources, thus unemployment, uh, falls to 5%, and we have reduced the cost push inflation and meet reached that 2% target. So this model is illustrating potentially what is going to happen from 2023 onward, what the goals are of central banks worldwide, um, and so on. If you have any questions, feel free to comment those questions below, and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.